AI Systems Institute. Uh, Mauro received uh, his PhD degree in Mechanical Engineering for ETH Zurich in 2019 and a joint project with the Ferrari F1 team. So he's uh, with a speed in his blood, like uh, some other Italians do. But before joining at TU, uh, he was a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University, uh, still in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And despite this kind of mechanical orientation of the names of the departments, Mauro's research interests are the at the intersections of control theory and optimization. And it's towards developing tools for designing, deploying, and operating sustainable mobi mobility systems. So he's an expert of optimal control theory, electric vehicles, and autonomous mobility on demand. He's got an outstanding career. He's already received like the outstanding bachelor award and the excellence scholarship and opportunity award from ETH Zurich. And uh, he is an excellent researcher, a very nice person, and a very nice speaker, as you will see. Thanks, Mauro, for joining. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for, for having me. Let me share the screen again. Let's see. I guess you can see it. Yes? Good. So thanks a lot for the very kind uh, introduction and the very kind invitation, of course. Uh, as, as we said at the beginning, uh, if you have any questions during, throughout the talk, please do interrupt me so we make it as interactive as it can be. So uh, as, well, as uh, Damiano said, uh, I'm really interested in, in mobility systems and specifically how to leverage and advance optimization methods to basically deploy intelligent mobility systems. And today I would like to give you an overview of, of my research interests. And you will see we will go from, from electric racing to a more mesoscopic uh, view on, on sustainable mobility. So the reason I'm working on, on uh, um, let's see. Okay, uh, the reason I'm working on, on mobility is because recently it has been facing uh, some challenges. And for instance, people are not really happy with their mobility choices. And this you can see in this, uh, in this plot where you basically see uh, Uber and Lyft and other transportation network companies skyrocketing um, in, in, the last, in the last decade, also with some detrimental effects on public transit, whereby uh, the, the demand kind of shifted. Second, um, this and, 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 uh, and other effects have also caused uh, significant uh, congestion problems. And this is really touching every country that we can think about. Even now in, 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 in these in this pandemic times, it doesn't seem we, we did learn uh, so much. Third, well, we all know that uh, we, are, we have a climate change problem and, and environmental pollution. Well, if you look at environmental pollution, transportation is responsible for about a fifth, in Europe even more, uh, of, of all um, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and it's one of the few sectors whereby emissions are still increasing. And last uh, but not least, I would also like to add that uh, this mobility is also um, responsible for noise pollution. And while many may think yeah, noise pollution is just, just annoying, actually it's not true, it's, uh, it's, it's bad for your health, it's, it's a very strong stressor, and, uh, and I think it will become the, the, the new pollutant and, and, and in the next decades once we finally uh, properly address uh, env environmental, environmental pollution. But okay, uh, let's also tell some, some good news. On, on the bright side, um, we're also witnessing the advent of uh, very interesting opportunities uh, coming from, from cyber physical systems, for, uh, such as uh, autonomous driving, uh, the internet of things and, and, and wireless communication. So basically connectivity, powertrain electrification, and then connectivity, of course, enabling the concept of sharing economies. And, and we also uh, have seen the concept of special purpose design. Now, yet it's not really clear how we can fit all these opportunities together to, to really address future and, and, and current mobility challenges, right? One of the visions we have is really uh, autonomous, connected, and electrified intelligent mobility systems. However, to really make the best out of it and to deploy them in the most sustainable way, we need to tailor um, their design and operation to the specific application. And this really calls, to, calls for tools to optimize their design and operation. This is basically what I'm interested in. Um, so on the vehicle level, um, I'm, I'm interested in mostly a powertrain design problem in terms of uh, de defining the architecture of the powertrain, uh, choosing the components, their technology, their sizing, and then also controlling them. If you can, I mean, Daniel mentioned the, the Formula One. Well, uh, Formula One car, um, the experience I made, well, it's, it's, a, it's a hybrid electric car and, and where you have to decide whether to use uh, the, the, the internal combustion engine or the electrical motor. And of course, the way you will coordinate these, these two um, movers will have a strong influence on the achievable laptop. Time. So really, it's also important that you, in the end, you devise 
properly designed control algorithms to, to minimize energy consumption and so on and so forth. Now, on the going from the vehicle level to the system level, I'm tackling more or less the same kind of problem. So optimizing the design of transportation systems and also devise operational strategies to really service demand in a sustainable, um, socially inclusive, and also market viable uh, fashion. And today we'll give um, you know, an overview on both of these uh, research lines. And of course, I will start with the vehicle level. Now, on the vehicle level, well, we all have been witnessing, especially in Norway, I must say, a strong electrification of, of um, vehicle propulsion systems. I mean, not only uh, passenger cars, but we see this also for uh, heavy duty trucks and not only in, in conventional transportation, but as I mentioned, also in racing. Uh, as I told you before, a uh, Formula One car is hybrid electric. Since 2014, it's, it has been strongly hybridized, such, so that the, the, the internal combustion engine is just 1.6 liters, which is very little considering the, the, the performance that this car has. And in the same year, 2014, we also witnessed the advent of the Formula E um, championship, really to push the deployment of, of technologies and, and, and ideas uh, towards electrifying vehicles with, with, with high performance. When we usually study uh, design problems, uh, powertrain design problems for, for electric vehicles, well, again, this is really the simplest that you can, you can have. Um, and basically, what you want to do is to size the, the battery that you have on board, right? Um, you want to size the electrical motor, and then this is connected to, to a gearbox, which basically is responsible for um, relating this, the speed of the wheels, the speed of the electric motor, right? And the way you could do this is for, with a fixed gear transmission. Many cars have a, just a fixed gear transmission. You can also imagine there are some bikes, right, where you cannot really change gear, that they're quite cheap. And the advantage of this kind of transmission is just, it, it's, quite, uh, it's quite simple, it's, it's lightweight, right? Um, and it's high efficient in terms of uh, mechanical power transmission. Or you could have multi-speed, multiple gears, and even arriving at a CVT, a continuously variable transmission, whereby, yeah, this kind of can mimic an infinite amount of gear ratios. And uh, while this first uh, approach could be, I don't know, helpful when you bike around in the Netherlands, where I'm currently uh, uh, in, in, in Switzerland, well, here, uh, it's nice to have the possibility of changing the gear ratio as you tackle a slope, right? So this kind of enables you to choose the gear ratio um, and, and therefore change the, the, the electric motor speed and therefore operate it at a higher efficiency. Of course, there's no free lunch using such a system while you have a, a lower um, efficiency in, 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 in power transmission first. And second, it's also a bit heavier, right? And more costly. But okay, we want them basically to be able to, to compare these different uh, technologies. And we want to do this design for, for a given mission, for a given driving cycle, depending on what you want to do, or well, you want to have the best um, powertrain. And it will also depend on, on, on where you are. Now we've been studying these, uh, these problems using uh, convex optimization methods, uh, reason being that you have these very nice global optimality guarantees, but also more, uh, more, uh, more standard uh, derivative-free optimization methods such as particle swarm optimization. What we managed to do is to study, okay, is, it, is using a CVT beneficial? Well, in this very preliminary, in these further results, you can, you can see that, yeah, you can, for semi-trailer tracks, you can really uh, reduce the battery size and also uh, the motor size using a continuously variable transmission. Um, so it's, it's quite an interesting uh, transmission type. And, and so we studied a bit in more detail because it's not as, as simple as you may, may think. You can see here a cost cut just of the variator. And, and you can see that when, when you design such a transmission, you have a lot of variables. And when you do design, well, you want to design given the use, right? So you have, you have a kind of a joint design problem. You want to optimize your geometry, but you also want to optimize the way you will use it. And ideally, you would like to optimize both concepts together, right? So this is kind of the idea. You, you want to minimize the plant costs, but also the controller um, costs in terms of uh, power losses and energy you need to use to, to operate this system, right? Um, and interestingly enough, you would, in this case, we, we managed to even do it in a causal fashion, meaning that we inc included a feedback controller which then could be directly implemented basically on the car. It's not optimizing the control trajectory of line with an omniscient view, but just the, 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 the control um, gains. And, and this problem can be solved in a joint fashion using nonlinear uh, programming, 
which is uh, NLP in, in my case, it's not uh, natural language processing as, as many in the audience may, may think it's uh, for us, it's nonlinear programming. So basically nonlinear optimization methods. And here you can see some results and you can see that the, the higher the, the plant costs, the, the lower the, the plant cost will be, but it will come at the expense of a higher control cost. And you see with this very nice Pareto flow. Now this, just to say, well, these the CVTs are a very interesting technology. They may be used in the future. They've been they're showing uh, promising results also on passenger cars. But what we asked ourselves were, well, can we also use it in racing, right? And, and to understand whether it makes sense to use it in racing, where well, you would like to find the best design and control for a CVT, for a race car, and the same for a fixed gear transmission. And then you can compare. If you do simulations or so, the models may be more accurate, but the, the heuristics and the controllers you use to, to, to um, basically control both, both types of cars may have an impact on your performance and therefore actually shift um, the, the order of which which one is, uh, is most suitable, right? So when, when we talk about racing, well, you don't really want to minimize energy consumption. It's rather a constraint because your battery size is finite, but you want to minimize lap time, which is the integral of one dt in time domain, right? Um, and, and this is basically uh, the, the, basically the power train I've shown you before. This is for like the Formula E as, as this structure. It's a rear uh, traction uh, car. You have a battery, you have an electric motor, maybe more electric motor in, in, in parallel, and then transmission. Um, and, and our inputs are basically the, the, the gear ratio of the transmission, the, the electrical motor power you're deploying, right, when accelerating, but also when braking. And you will see that you can all, not always brake as much as you want. Um, your state variables are the kinetic energy and the battery energy of the car, right? How much battery you have and how fast you're going. And you also have uh, um, two transmission technology. We said a fixed gear transmission, which is lightweight, more efficient, but you cannot change the speed of the motor as you want. And the CVT is heavier. It's a bit less efficient, but you can operate the, the electric motor as you want, basically. Okay. To solve this problem, we have to shift the problem in space domain. Why? Well, first it becomes a finite horizon problem. You know where the lap is finishing, right? You start here, you can measure the distance you will drive and it finish, finishes here, right? Second, you can also implement position dependent parameters such for instance, as the a maximum speed profile, uh, which you can see dashed here. And basically these models, the maximum speed at which you can go depending on where you are on the racetrack. So you can see you start here, we, left, we have some corners and in fact, this maximum speed profile goes down several times, indicating the presence of this car. Then you have some straights and you can see them here. So this way we have a 1D uh, problem instead of 3D. But we can do that because we have, a, we have very good drivers that take care of, of finding the, best, the fastest path. So then since we are in space domain, you don't take the derivative with respect of time, but the dynamics are expressed as a, as a function of space, of position, and therefore uh, your input is no longer power, but force. And force is basically power over speed. Um, now, what we want to do is to frame it as a convex optimization problem. And you may ask why. Well, you do convex, when you do convex optimization, you have convex models. It's very nice, but you have to kind of sacrifice a bit the, the model accuracy, right? So you have to do some parametric uh, models or whatever uh, fitting type or identification or data-driven methods you want. But in the end, you want some convex objects, right? Um, however, this is the big advantage that you can first, the solution you will get is globally optimal, guaranteed. So you can do really a comparison between technology because this is really the best I can get with the CVT, the best I can get with the FGT, with the fixed gear transmission, and then compare. And you will converge in polynomial time. So that's another nice thing. You, you converge pretty fast. Good. Now, we said that objective is lap time. Well, in space domain, it's, um, you can see, it's the integral of DTDS. We call it the lethargy, um, which is basically the inverse of speed, right? So you want to integrate one over V uh, DS over the, over the lab. And the letter, well, we said it's one over V DS. So very nice is a first constraint we have. And, and you may ask, is this constraint convex? But if you look at the function one over V, it, is, it has a very nice convex uh, shape for, for, positive, for non negative values of, of V, which is what we're interested in, right? Um, however, the function is convex, but this constraint is not convex. We can, we, can, however, take the epigraph. So if we relax, if we write greater or equal than one over V, that's convex. Then we can take V on the left-hand side, which is nicer for, for the solver. And we can just say DTDS times V greater or equal than one. You may argue now, well, but this is not physical. What we want is DTDS times V equal to one, right? Um, 
so why can we do that? So once again, it's not, let's repeat why it's not convex. If I take a point here and I point here, and then I basically unite them, the points in between are not in the set. So the, the set is not convex, unless we relax it and we say, we can, you can also stay above. Now, if, you, if I fix the speed, 150, and I say, you can basically be on this line, whatever you want. This is the minimum value. Since you're minimizing the TDS, guess where the solver is gonna go? Of course, it's gonna converge here. So basically you get a convex problem. So global optimality guarantees and polynomial time convergence um, and a physical solution. So it's really the best out of both worlds. You can do the same with the kinetic energy. Also this constraint, I mean, this function is convex, but not the, the constraint. So what do we do? We relax it. We say you can stay above. And again, you can show that you will, the, the, the constraints will be strongly active. What does it mean for you? Then you get a convex problem. Good. So basically, this is what I was saying. At the optimum, basically, you get a physical solution that holds with the quality. But it's always better to we always double check these constraints because yeah, sometimes you, you find out uh, new things or or or, or you yeah. Good. Uh, having said that, we also have all the components of the power trains. Um, you can see them here: the transmission, electric motor, and the battery. For the sake of time, we'll just focus on the electric motor. You can refer to this manuscript, which is currently under review. If you want to see the details. Let's focus on the electric motor. Basically, it's a device that provides you mechanical power at the cost of electrical uh, power, right? So you input uh, electric power and you get out mechanical power and losses. Now, how can we model the losses? Well, they will depend on the mechanical power and on the speed. Usually, they make a in convex uh, optimization. They make a quadratic uh, function of, of just the mechanical power. But here, speed is of paramount importance because we're also optimizing the gear ratio. So what we do here is to devise a quadratic function um, whereby we define x as 1 omega p. Why do we do that? Because as x will multiply qx, you will have cross term, we have a constant, cross terms to omega and p, and then basically omega p, omega squared, and p squared. And if q is symmetric and positive semi-definite, no problem. This function is convex. Okay. Then what we did, uh, we, we fit the function, and it can be fit and identified using semi-definite programming also having this, this constraint on symmetricity and positive semi-definiteness. Semi and you can see that the model in the end, which is a parametric model, uh, has a very good uh, error, in fact, uh, well below 1%. So nice, we can use it. Now, however, we need to go back to space domain. So no power, but forces. And here is where it gets a bit more complicated. Um, so we relax as usual because this is quadratic. So FDC greater or equal to FMDC, you will never pick an FDC which is greater because it would use more battery energy that you need to, and this is suboptimal, right? Um, and then we have this quadratic uh, function here again, where X is one omega FMV. FMV is a problem, it's nonlinear. And here you need to divide by, by V because instead of power, you need force. So you need to divide by V also this term. So what can you do? Well, it's not completely convex. If the velocity if speed is a, if it would be given here, just here, it would be convex. So what do you do? You solve a simplified version. You take the optimal speed profile. You feed it here as a parameter. You solve again, you check your new speed profile. You feed it again and you, and you iterate until you converge, right? So this is what we did as a first approach. It's very nice, it works, but you lose global optimality guarantees. Uh, so one why may, may argue, why are you doing this in the first place? You just do no linear programming. So is there another way? And that's something that, that, that I was taught um, in, in, in ETH Zurich uh, when I was doing my, my, my master uh, studies there. They told me uh, 12, often 12 hours of computations can save you five minutes of thinking. Uh, so if, if we look at a, a bit more at, at the problem, what do we see? Okay. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to divide this equation twice by speed. So if I divide power by speed, we get force. If, we, if, we, if I divide it by speed again, I have 1 over V, which is the lethargy, the TDS, you remember. Good. And we have it here. So P divided by V is F and divided by V again, the TDS. If I divide this term, so here I've taken PM and put it on the, on the left-hand side, right? If I take this term and I divide it by speed twice, well, I can divide once xm, right? Because it's present twice. So xm divided by speed is, well, one divided by speed is the TDS, this we know. The electric motor uh, speed is basically the gear ratio times uh, the final drive ratio the, divided by the wheel radius, good. And power divided by speed is force, this we know, good. So this is quadratic, we have relaxed it, uh, all, lo all looking good. What can we do now? We do a Cholesky factorization, which is basically we take the, allow me to say um, in a very practical style, we take the square root of the matrix. 
Okay, and we can do it because it's symmetric and posit um, positive semi-definite. Um, then we define Z as basically CY, and then you can see basically this expression is Z transpose Z. And this is basically a geometric uh, mean equality and can be written as a second order conic constraint. So basically this is how you can write the constraint in the end. And this is a second order conic constraint, uh, which is convex. So what we get in the end is a second order conic program. It's fully convex. We get global optionality guarantees, which means two things. Again, global optionality guarantees, sorry. And you can solve it very fast. How fast? Well, one lap in the uh, Le Mans circuit parsing six seconds, solving one second to global optimality. Basically two seconds, you have the solution with the fixed gate transmission, which is in blue here and the CVT, which is in black. What do you observe? The, the, the speed profile looks pretty, pretty similar, which makes sense in racing. The difference are at milliseconds. Uh, if, if you don't know if you follow Formula One, uh, I think today is the first uh, free, free practice day. Um, but there's some difference. And in fact, at the end of the day, the fixed gate transmission car is a bit slower. Why is that? Let's look a bit more carefully at the, at, the, at the difference between the speed profiles. If you take this, this corner here in the middle, you see that, okay, the brake is more or less the same, but then the CVT car accelerates a bit faster. Why is that? Well, it can deploy, apparently, changing the gear ratio. The, C, the, the FGT cannot, it's fixed. It's like the bike with just one gear. You just stick to it and do whatever you can. Uh, here, you basically we switch gears. We have an infinite amount of gears. We switch the ratio up to here. We deploy full power and then we, we, we can accelerate faster. And you, you may know uh, from Formula One, um, the ones who follow it, you, they say you win races in corners. When you are slow, when the cars are slow, it's the best point to have an extra speed. Why? You're minimizing one over VDS. If you do a Taylor expansion, it's basically one over V minus one over V squared times delta V. The smaller v squared, the V and therefore V squared, the bigger will be one over V squared. And therefore the better it will be to add a delta V. That's why you really want to push as much as possible the exit of the corner, right? And this is why you get way faster. At the end of the straight, you start getting slower because the FGT car is lighter and we took this into account. So first it's, it's, it's less heavy, so you can accelerate more. It has higher, higher transmission efficiency. So the mechanical power that the wheel sees is a bit higher. And you can see it very nicely in this plot. At low speed, the CVT vehicle is can accelerate faster. At higher speeds, while well, you start having these effects, more efficiency, um, lighter, and therefore you accelerate more. But at lower speeds, well, uh, the, the FGT vehicle is still, uh, the, the speed is here basically, and it will accelerate up to here, whilst the CVT just keeps it here. Why? Because here you are already at full power. For the FGT, you will have less power, you have torque limited, less power, less power, and, and then you reach it, and you can see it here. So in this case, the CVT can significantly outperform the FGT vehicle. However, we didn't get a, go out and say, okay, uh, everyone should use a continuously variable transmission and throw away your fixed gear transmissions, right? This would be a bit uh, arrogant. So we have, we have this tool, we said, okay, let's do, it takes one second to solve. You get global optimality guarantees, you get really the achievable lap time. What can, why don't we do a study, right? For different motor sizes, different battery uh, sizes, what do you get? So we did this, basically brute forced in this case, the, the, the motor sizing and the battery allowance. And you can see here the results. And you can see that there, you don't have a unique uh, solution. I mean, the fastest is the FGT, but you really need a twice as big motor, which may not even fit under the hood. So then you need the, the, the big picture in mind, right? If you say, okay, instead of putting one motor, I put two, well then, uh, you have to cool it down, you have to, and so on and so forth. So may, maybe you need to redesign the car. So you need the big picture in mind. But okay, for this, we, we, we are neglecting this in this analysis. You can also appreciate the fact that the, the smaller the motor gets, and you can also see this relative difference here, and this SM is how big, how much was the motor scaled, the faster the, the CVT car gets, right? Because you can really play around with the, with the gear ratio and operate always at, at maximum power. So for some, for some configuration, the CVT is better and for others, the FGT is better. Which one is the best? Well, it really depends on, on the powertrain design. You will say, okay, nice. Um, it, this is a, a pretty interesting result, yet we are, we are neglecting a feature which is of paramount importance in, in race cars, in electric race cars. So in a nutshell, if you have a hybrid electric vehicle, your prime mover is the internal combustion engine and your, your hybridization is putting basically a, a battery where you can you have a buffer and you can recharge and discharge and so on. 
in my opinion, an electric vehicle, an electric race car is the same, but basically the prime mover is the electrical motor and the battery is just going to be basically, yeah, you can regenerate, uh, break a bit, but you will deploy it, right? So it's like the fuel tank. Your buffer will be the temperature of the components because all the losses here will really heat up the components and they cannot get too hot. Otherwise, the, the, the magnets start uh, stop working, the battery is overheats, and, and then you're done. Right. So you really need to take into account overheating effects. And we did this and we said, okay, let's start using a, an engineering approach, define one temperature describing the electric motor uh, temperature, lumped parameter approximation that uh, we uh, control engineers uh, like quite a lot. But well, it doesn't work. It's, it's not accurate, not, no, nowhere near uh, accuracy. To really do that, we took this, this permanent, usually in racing, use permanent magnet uh, electric uh, motors. And we had to do basically a thermal network with six nodes. So the shaft, the rotor, the magnets you see here in green, the uh, winding in yellow, the end winding here, basically the cables you have, right? The copper cables, and, and, and then uh, the stator and then ambient. And this is basically the, the lamp parameter thermal network we got, which gave us, uh, let's say, satisfying re results. Once we had this, basically we, um, we, 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 we test, validated this using, uh, this is from the software MotorCAD, basically, to see whether our models make sense, right? We follow the quadratic rationale of before, we use the iterat an iterative solution algorithm, and here you can see the results. It's a for fixed gear transmission. If you look at the lower plot, this is one lap starting cold, right? That the coolant temperatures, you see that the uh, dashed lines are more or less in line with the with the solid lines, and uh, this says basically that our models are pretty pretty precise. What you can also appreciate is that if you take into account temperature constraints in black, well, this will be you will be a couple of seconds uh, slower, even even almost three seconds here, right? And and you're starting cold. You can see you cannot recuperate as much as you want because it will overheat. And uh, what you also can appreciate is that the end windings, in it's what really you need to ke keep under control. Okay. Maybe you may think, yeah, but what about the stator? Well, the limit for the stator is not this dotted line, which is the limit for the magnets, which is are here well below, but the limit for the stator is well above. So no problem. Really the limit here is the end windings. Okay. Now what happens in a race where you have basically periodic solutions and, and you're basically pushing a, a lap after the other, you basically put periodicity constraints on the temperatures and this is what you get. On the left-hand side, fixed transmission, right-hand side, CVT, you see they're more or less the same. Um, what do you see? First, the magnets here are the limiting factors. Huh? That's what you're limiting you in the race. Um, second, you can see that the lap time difference is between 10 and 15 seconds slower once your temperature constraint there. You, cannot, you don't even try to regeneratively break because you would overheat. You can also appreciate the fact that, yeah, if you look at, in this case, the FGT was faster if you would not constrain it using the temperature. But uh, if you put temperature constraints, the CVT is faster. Why is that? Well, our interpretation is that, well, you can choose the speed, right? The CVT, so you can operate at the maximum efficiency, the motor, reduce, increase efficiency, reduce losses, and losses are basically heating effects. That's why, uh, it's faster. Okay, you can push the motor a bit more. But again, this would require then uh, more validation. This is a contribution we just got accepted at ECCN. We're very looking forward to, to, to more uh, detailed dis discussion. But okay, I think that the, the main point of this first part is really that, yeah, these tools we really like, these convex optimization tools, but you need tractable models. It is a, motor, a standard motor map we use in, in another paper. Um, and this is the convex model we did. And we really had to, to, to think quite a lot to make them more or less uh, agree. And you see there's still differences, right? So what, what you have probably heard uh, a thousand times is like uh, every model is wrong. Some are useful, right? And we'd like to have more useful uh, models, especially for design. Because when you talk about sizing the motor, it's not that you just stretch it like a harmonium. There's a lot of parameters that you can use and tune, like the air gap, the slot depth, tooth width. These are just some, the length, the di diameter, and so on and so forth. So one, one thing uh, we're, we're starting to think, and I think this is the right venue to, to push such an idea, why can't, you use, can't we use kind of uh, merging models and data-driven methods such as neural nets or something affine to this, whereby basically these are, these are your uh, inputs, you learn something that is still mathematically tractable, maybe a bit more complicated, 
and gives you basically an output which, which you can use then when you do the design studies. This is just an idea I'm gonna put there on the plate and if someone is interested, just, just contact me. But I think um, some OEMs are already going in this direction because it's, it's a way of exploring your design space in a kind of clever, artificially clever fashion. Yeah, good. Having said that, basically this is, this research can be applied to a plethora of vehicles. We're working on, on, uh, on micromobility, we're working on uh, racing and, and semi-trailers and, and so on and so forth. And really looking forward to, to these uh, new uh, results. So this is basically the first part, which prompts me to go um, to the second part, which is more focused on uh, transportation systems. Now, the, um, are there any questions so far? Okay, let me continue then. Um, I'm working also on, on mobility systems. And the reason why, well, or, or, or a picture can motivate this research, you can find, you, you can really see it here. And what I see in this picture is basically all the detrimental effects I've seen before. People, people do not seem really happy to be stuck there. Uh, you have a lot of congestion, a lot of pollution, a lot of noise pollution, right? And, and municipalities are really struggling to find sustainable ways, right? Some people have said, yeah, let's put in uh, road tolls. Uh, um, some, some politicians are just uh, uh, pushing the, the blame, uh, throwing the blame around. But it's clear we, we do need the mobility concepts but the potential is limited because the infrastructure is, is more or less fixed, right? You cannot build an, another uh, lane of the car, for cars and so on. So one question could be, okay, uh, autonomous driving is, is, is coming, is slowly becoming a reality. Will these, uh, we, would, could fleets of uh, autonomous vehicles providing on-demand mobility, so autonomous mobility on-demand systems, which is basically robotic ro robot taxis save the day. And many people say, yes, of course, you, you can drive them closer. Uh, you can uh, centrally control them in a system optimal way. And other people say, yeah, fine, but you may induce more demand because it may be cheap, right? And more comfortable, it's door to door. Shift demand from public transit. We have already seen this in the, at the beginning of the presentation uh, with, with the standard, the classical transportation network companies. And I mean, you would still have a lot of cars on the road. I mean, if I show you this and I tell you these cars are autonomous or not, the throughput efficiency of such a mobility system is this one, right? And you may claim, well, it's not the best, right? Um, then you could take, okay, these people and put them on, on, on three buses, for instance, or, or uh, one light rail train or one of these uh, trolley buses that you can see in Zurich and other, other uh, very nice cities. Also in Eindhoven, we have, we have uh, electric buses, right? And then you could say, okay, well, let's, let's all go with public transit. Yes, but public transit is not point to point. So it doesn't bring you from your doorstep to where you have to go. So a question, an interesting question is, why don't we get the best out of both worlds, right? Uh, we connect public transit with these autonomous mobility on demand systems in so-called intermodal MOD frameworks. And the question is, how should we operate such a system? And to which extent is such cooperation beneficial? And to address especially the latter question, once again, we use convex optimization because you get global optimality guarantees, right? So to model the system, we step back and we step back quite a lot. We will look at vehicles as fluids, okay? So we use the graphs um, and, and basically where, whereby arcs are roads and nodes are, are intersections and you have uh, fluids representing uh, vehicles driving around. Then you have another graph representing public transit. And the, these are the trees here are, are basically public transit line. And then we add another network in between. This layer is of crucial importance. Is, it mimics the fact that you can walk around, but also intermodality. You can get, get out of your house, walk a bit, get on a car, get out, um, go on public transit, get out, and then you arrive. Right. So it's really, it's really comprehends the, the whole. Um, we use a network flow model. So again, fluid, a fluidic uh, model. We represent customers and vehicles as fluids. And we use a time invariant demand, which is very, very well in line with our mesoscopic planning perspective. So we look at the system at rush hour at steady state. And it's uh, perf perfectly acceptable. You may say, okay, but how, how are you going to deal with, with travel time? I mean, the more vehicles, subway and walking, no problem. We take averages, but, but right, it's pretty fixed. The more cars you have on the roads, the, the, more, the more the travel time, right? And this is how it looks like usually. This is basically how much you should stretch the travel time given how many cars you have on the road. 
this is a uh, very common, uh, very, very well known in transportation, uh, Bureau of Public Roads uh, uh, delay function. Now, um, what we're gonna say is, okay, um, assume there's some private vehicle flow. So there's already some vehicles on the road and we will look at it for different levels. What we're gonna do is basically say, okay, we cannot, our fleet, our vehicle cannot increase travel time above the private vehicles in difference level. If, we, if I increase your trip time by 5%, you will not notice, right? So let's say that this 5% in Praticone style terms is zero. Okay, we will basically assume a constant here and this will be our capacity. We cannot go above this capacity, but this is how much space we have for our vehicles. And it's a very nice threshold congestion model, which enables us then ultimately to frame this problem as a linear program. So this is, can be solved very quick, which is nice because here we'll have at least a million variables, if not more. Um, where you can basically minimize a combination of, uh, we, we, get, we really take a societal perspective. So all, everyone's travel time, operational cost for uh, driving the MOD and also for public transit. Okay. Now, we have considered in this study, um, Berlin and New York City. Okay. And these are basically, um, you can, well, Berlin is this one and obviously this is this Manhattan. Um, they have very different uh, features. New York City, way more, uh, way more demands, of course. In Berlin, a bit longer trips. And also the, the public transit infrastructure in Berlin is a, seems to be a bit more uh, capillar. Okay? Since we're not the only ones on the road, basically we solve for different levels of private vehicles flows. Right? We saw, every time we solve an LP, and these are the results. On the left-hand side, Berlin. Right-hand side, New York City. The more traffic there is, travel time will grow societal cost will grow and emission will decrease from, from our system and not from, from traffic in general, of course. And you will see also the color is the, the, the model shift. Basically, you go from 90% autonomous driving vehicles uh, to almost zero. And, and as, as congestion increases, you have a more, more uh, public transit usage. And since public transit is not a point-to-point -point transportation mean, some people also walk. In New York City, the trend is similar. You walk a bit more because is, is uh, public transit is a bit less capillary. Okay, now we said the this is the intermodal case. How much is the intermodal framework gaining from um, a kind of vanilla autonomous mobility on demand system? And this is a comparison with it. So you solve without public transit, with public transit, you do the difference. How much can you improve if you cooperate? Here is the answer. CO2 cost and travel time between 20 and 50%. It means instead of taking uh, 15 minutes, it takes you 10 minutes, which is quite a lot. So it, coordination with public transit significantly reduces uh, the cost and it's really the way to go. Mauro, may I interrupt just a moment? There's a question yes. from the audience. I don't know if you read it. Uh, there's no. uh, are you assuming that the public transport network is given or are, they, this, or are there design decisions, I think? That's a great question. For this study, we assume it's there. And we, we also assumed, um, let's see, in the conference paper, we, we did put a congestion uh, le, um, a limit. In the other paper, we did not. But it's, that's actually very important. We, we did other, other studies where we did consider then also public transit. Because of course, you cannot say, yeah, I'm going to take all the people and just throw them on the trains and have as much capacity as you want, right? Yet to jointly solve this problem, um, you have, there's one small uh, trick. You can you, you say, okay, I increase capacity and basically increasing the number of trains. But we will also reduce the access times, right? Because it takes you less to board a train uh, on average because it's more often. And then that would be nonlinear in the, in the flows. But yeah, th that's, that's really one of the questions we're, we're trying to, uh, to address. We did the pre some preliminary works. Um, I, the paper is not here, but you, ca you can check it out. And basically there we used co-design to basically look, okay, uh, should we rather invest in public transit or having more cars, right? Those were the, the questions, yeah. Thanks, thanks for the, for the question, yeah. Okay, so we want to be intermodal. Well, you may say, wait, what if this AMOD system, because in this case, we could also, we didn't also apply such a big constraint on public transit because we're not so predominant, right? In this case, what if AMOD becomes uh, pr predominant and significantly affect the travel time of, of the fleet and of private vehicles? Meaning, if this is the flows that you have, instead of having one for the scaling of a travel time, you have three. So factor three, and I guess that private vehicle user may mind and change the routes, right? 
So you start to smell a kind of game theoretical Stackelberg equilibrium kind of problems. What I do, we do something and then private vehicles will minimize their own lap time. Uh, sorry, travel time, right? So can we tackle this? Yes. So uh, this is the, from an intermodal MOD perspective, same framework. You want to, the travel time now is a function of private vehicles, which now we consider as given, or users flows and rebalancing flows, because also the empty cars count, right? Okay, and here, for instance, you can see one, uh, one vehicle conservation constraint. But let's focus on this function. Well, this, this cost is unfortunately nonlinear because you have a nonlinear cross terms only with the users. If you would also have the private vehicles, the rebalancing here, it may still be convex. This way, you, you, you destroy convexity. So what did we do? I said, okay, since the BPR function is wrong anyway, right? Um, let's refit it as a piecewise affine function. And you can choose how, like two lines or, or three lines in green, uh, as many as you want. And then basically, this is what becomes of your, of your travel uh, time function, which becomes um, affine, piecewise affine, right? Then, of course, you need to measure how much you are exceeding each of these thresholds with these epsilons. And these epsilons are zero if you're below and, and this value if you're above. So you take the maximum between zero and how much you are basically, and, and the difference, right? So it's only the positive uh, value of the your position and basically the, the threshold position, right? This function is convex. <laughs> but the constraint is not, so we can relax it. We put a greater or equal. We don't even need the maximum. We just split it, greater or equal than zero and greater or equal than this one. So convex relaxations, you get a quadratic program, linearly constrained, fantastic. What does it mean for us? It's convex. So again, we can solve it, uh, compute the global optimum with uh, off-the-shelf QP solvers. Perfect, so we're, but, but, but wait a sec. What about the private vehicles? Well, the private vehicles, um, they are minimizing their own travel time. So it's not, you don't really minimize travel time times the flows. You need to take the integral. Let me not go into details. It's a traffic assignment problem. Given users and rebalancing flows fixed, we can solve it super quick. There's really transportation people here have done a fantastic job and you can solve it very quickly. So good. So what do we want to solve ultimately? It's this Stackelberg by level problem. You want to minimize our cost as intermodal MOD, knowing that the private vehicles will react with this traffic assignment problem. And here it's not convex. And good luck in solving this. So what we did decide to do here is to basically iterate. And you have no global optimality guarantees, but it converges pretty quickly and pretty nicely. And the results are, make sense. So we consider this as basically uh, our solution. And that's what we did. So what, what did we learn? First, um, you can see that if you just consider only cars, no walking, no subway, we have a penetration rate on the on the x uh, axis. Zero is uh, everyone is private. One is we have AMOD. Difference is private vehicles they park them. AMOD you have to be re rebalanced. What happens? The travel time goes up, which is not so surprising if you think of the traffic that is new transportation network company. I mean, there's there's been a lot uh, of, of debate and also papers showing that there was more traffic because people were driving around empty. And in fact, the the miles increase, and you can see that yeah. Even though we're doing centralized, I mean, private vehicles are at a, a, a Nash equilibrium. They're doing worse than they could do if they would be uh, centrally routed. If we centrally route them, but also rebalance, we have more vehicle flows, we have more traffic. And so even though we're doing centralized system optimal routing, we're worse. And that's a structural problem. Now let's add a bit of subway, just a little bit, you see? Just a little bit of subway. Travel times go down. In fact, it's worthwhile using our system right from the beginning, right? So you also have an incentive of using the MOD because you can basically, if there's traffic, you jump on the subway. So with public transit, the combination is very beneficial. Okay, let's start being a bit active. Let's walk a bit. You add walking, travel time goes down. It's basically halved. And also the miles and traveled miles now go down. Now, let me say, let's even do it, let's have it the Dutch way, which means let's bike, okay? Um, travel time goes down even more. For biking, we add a vehicle conservation constraint, but you can check out the, the details uh, in the paper. So, I mean, combining in AMOD with public transit and, and active modes in intermodal fashion is extremely beneficial. And in fact, if you look here, mi minus 20%, uh, um, driven, uh, driven kilometers and travel time basically goes up by a factor of two. So, perfect, let's do it. But 
and there's a bat. And this is basically the, the part where the, the bad guy from the movie comes in. Um, there's no free lunch. And in fact, there, there is a small catch-22 here, which is this one. If everyone is doing uh, is using uh, the, the intermodal MOD and you would take your car then, it would be even faster. And then you say, okay, wh wh why not? You start doing, then your neighbor sees, sees you and says, okay, you know what, I'm also gonna use my car and so on. But then, then you start shifting left and, and before you know it, you're back in the hell where you are. And if you think about, this is a so-called wicked problem. How many times did, have you thought if everyone, this, this year, if everyone would stay at home for one month, not seeing anyone, we would, right? But then some people profit a bit, you also, and this is the wickedness of, of this whole problem. So this tragedy principle of last, say again? I think, it's, I think it's called the tragedy of commons. Yes, 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 precise, yeah. So the last part of my presentation will be also very brief, but it's just about this dilemma here, which is how can we get people back to public transit, right? Um, let's consider a very simple setup. So forget the super complicated network of before. We start simple because it's not so simple as, as it seems. And you can find the, the details in this paper we, we will present at ECC in a couple of months. So either you go fast, or you go a bit slower with an intermodal fashion, right? This could be the intermodal MOD and this is the private vehicles. Let's say this, okay? So what, what if, if you don't do anything, the Nash equilibrium here is that so ma as many people will start using the, the fast arc until this gets as low as this one. And then you have an equilibrium. It doesn't matter which one you choose, right? It's kind of the definition for a parallel arc network. Because I mean, your, the discomfort that you perceive depends on the flows you are fear and also the, the societal cost. But for you, I mean, it's, it's a discomfort. You know? The travel time depends on how many uh, people we have on the arcs. You, you can remember the, 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 the quartic, uh, quadratic polynomial, or quartic, or the travel time you've seen before. Good. One thing you could do is just you put tolls here, disincentivate people using cars. Um, for instance, in California now, they're doing these fast track uh, lanes where you basically, you pay and you go faster. They used to be carpooling, but now you, now, now you pay. Um, the issue with this, with this uh, um, system is that if you're low income, not only most probably you will have a longer commute anyway. On top of that, you cannot even afford this. So it's, it's really, it's not equitable at all. So I said, I mean, there's a fantastic amount of literature on, on tolling schemes. And I think it's extremely valuable. But from a societal, per, from an ethical perspective, I, I am not convinced on about how fair it is. Okay, so what can we do? Well, let's use artificial currencies, a point system. You give points, everyone, if you go fast, you pay, you go slow, you receive. And let me describe the setup. So we assume every day people wanna go from, from left to right, so from, from A to B every morning. You want to go to the Trondheim University or Eindhoven University of Technology or, or uh, uh, wherever you are, right? You have your commute. Um, the individual agent so choices are binary vectors. So either one zero here or zero one. If you take the average, you will have, I don't know, 40%, 60%, good. Municipalities, society wants you to, would like the aggregate flows to be such that the societal costs are minimized. So this is X star whereby basically flows cannot be negative and that doesn't make sense. And the sum could be either one or, I mean, who hasn't done home office this year? So basically you have a probability of going. If you do, I mean, this is zero uh, in, in lockdown times. It may, hopefully it will get up to, I don't know, 80, 90%, but okay. Some people can stay at home, fine. Um, in contrast on fair monetary tolls, we use an artificial currency. We call it karma because we borrowed the term from, a, from, a, from another paper. And the idea is really, the crucial idea of this karma is that you can need, neither buy it nor exchange it. So if you want more karma, you go slow. If you want, if you, once you have some car, you, you can go fast and pay. You pay and you receive, right? Good, very simple. No bidding, uh, no bidding uh, me mechanism, so on and so forth. Just you, if you want to go fast, you pay, otherwise you receive, good. And you, you pay P1 and you receive a reward R2, which is minus P2, P2 is, is negative. So your karma level next day is the karma you had yesterday minus what you paid. You pay P1 if you go one zero and zero one if you go basically this, this arc here. And you cannot go negative. That's because otherwise it, the, the, the currency doesn't make sense. We want that at the equilibrium, basically the, the karma level of the population stays constant, okay? 
So basically, this this creates the only equilibrium that 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 basically would correspond with the with the uh, desired uh, system optimum. Very nice. Now, arguably, having fixed this this degree of freedom, so basically, p one over r two is equal to x two x two star over x one star. You cannot change much more. You, you have two variables. You have two degrees of freedom, right? But if I tell you that this is monopoly money, uh, Harry Potter money, whatever uh, currency you would like, uh, you would like to use, right? That's it. If I say that the price is two and the reward is one, or if I say 20, 10, 200, 100, doesn't change anything. So you don't have additional degrees of freedom. Good. So um, let's hope that it works, basically. In these two arcs case, we're studying more, more complicated case, but two arcs, you just need to cross your fingers, right? Okay, so what about the individual agents? Now, uh, they want to minimize the discomfort or the travel time perceived today with a sensitivity as high. So maybe today I, I'm not, I'm on a rush because I have to give the presentation. My sensitivity is high and, and, and maybe, I don't know, uh, Damiano is not so much, is less on a rush, right? And so his sensitivity is lower and it changes every day, right? Um, okay, so in, in conventional tolling schemes, what do you do? You have a value of time, which basically is related to how rich you are, what is your income, what you can afford, times how on a rush, how much on a rush you are. And that's the value of time. It's a weight you multiply with the travel time plus the prices and you take the minimum, right? It's a way of comparing uh, time with price. If you are high income, you will, V will be high, you rather look at T at the time. If you're low income, you rather look at the price because that, that weight is small. In this case, and that's fantastic. It's a static problem. It's fantastic. It's, it's, in this case, you're playing against your future self. If you go fast today, you have to go slow tomorrow. And, and, and that's way more complicated. I mean, it's more complicated. Um, so what do we do? Okay, we, we consider people to be MPC, model predictive controllers. So you have a receding horizon way of, of, uh, of reasoning. You plan for the week ahead, but I mean, come on, you're not planning every day. We are not that smart. I, I can at least uh, speak for myself. So what do you have? You have average actions for that you imagine to have the rest of the week considering an average sensitivity. It's okay. The rest of the week, I assume, will be 40% here and 60% there, right? And then you, you play it against what you will do today. Today you do this, the rest of the week, this is your cost. You take the minimum. And at the end of the week, you have kind of um, uh, a karma level constraint. You don't want to go, well, you don't want to go below zero, but actually we... we like to be a bit conservative. Maybe you want some reference value and you don't want to go below that one. And maybe for me it's P1 and for other people it's a bit more. You may say, I want at least to be able to go fast at the end of the week. And every day you solve this. Good. Every day we, we to simulate the people, we consider the Nash equilibrium. So basically we consider an infinite amount of agents and we approximate their flows with the Nash equilibrium. It's really a static perspective. And the Nash equilibrium basically... Once they all choose, you look at the discomfort and you say, does anyone wants to change uh, her or his mind? And if no one raises uh, her hand, then that's equilibrium. You can solve it iterating and it, it converges very, very, very quickly. So let, let, me, let me wrap up. Okay, what happens then? What happens? It works. You can check the, the theorems and, and, and so on and, and it works. And you can see here, here we gave a lot of karma to the agents. Why? At the beginning, the karma doesn't play a role. Be, at, People have too much, so you have, are basically at the uncontrolled equilibrium, which you see here in terms of flow. And then once people start depleting the, their karma, well, the, the societal cost, the extra societal cost, which is 30% more travel time, here goes down and reaches the system optimum. Why? Because the flows reached the optimum, right? Why? Because the karma levels have gone to this steady state. So what happens? We are in this case, we're able to make people save 30% of time on average. You could have said, why, why don't you take, I mean, it's very nice, the scheme, because you, you basically, um, you don't need bidding uh, transactions. Also, from a, from a fa um, decision fatigue perspective, it, it's, it's pretty uh, easy. So what do you do? You, however, constrain people to make this choice. You could say, why don't you just take, okay, um, I need 50% of the population on this arc and the rest on the other arc. And every day you do this decision arbitrarily. Then you don't take into account whether, uh, whether people are on a rush or not. You take them away what a lot, quite a lot of freedom. And you see it here. 
but you can see that our, our actual perceived discomfort is actually 50% lower than an optimal but urgency and aware allocation. So in total, with this very simple scheme, no bidding or, or so, just a payment transaction, fast or slow, you can save up to 45-50%. Of course, this is just the first step. And, and, and we're really motivated for this research because ultimately the performance of a system um, is, is, is really related not only to the design, but to what people do with it. And from an AI perspective, well, there's a lot because saying that people are model predictive controllers and are able to solve mixed integer linear programs is maybe a bit uh, uh, optimistic. So we want to learn the agent's dynamics from an aggregate perspective and perhaps also leverage tools like reinforcement learning to adjust the pricing online. And of course, then consider multi-arcs and intermodal uh, networks to see before. Good, having said that, uh, got to the to the conclusion i really think that the advent of uh, the cyber physical technologies is really um giving us giving rise to a new uh, fundamentally new class of social technical problems and really at the interface of transportation systems mechanical engineering optimization or economics social science and so on and so forth and i'm really looking forward um, to bridge the gap i think now is, is really the right moment because on the one hand these technologies are coming and, and the problems are, are relevant and, and urgent and on the other hand, we really have the models, the optimization tools, the AI algorithms and, and computational power to really solve these problems and hopefully give a contribution to science and, and well, ultimately and hopefully again uh, to society. So this was my last slide. Um, thanks a lot for, uh, for your kind invitation and I'm very open to questions. Thanks a lot, Mauro. Extremely inspiring and motivating. I really, really, really like it. I think that we have time uh, maybe for some questions uh, very fast. So I see that already there's one here. Thanks for the interesting, grazie for the interesting and entertaining presentation. Uh, Mauro, this question is about uh, Formula One and uh, uh, Formula Electric. One of the main aspects is the reliability of engines, both thermal and electrical. The question is, if one does not want to be DNF or penalized, how will the CVT impact the reliability of the engine and the car over more than 20 races in one season? Especially yeah. since the CVT is increasing performances of the car in corners, and this is when the car is the most constrained. G-force with braking, accelerating. Mm -hmm. Well, um, no, the CVT can, can potentially really, really improve uh, quite a lot of the performance. And also, also, we really saw it here. Uh, from um, from the electric motor, also from a, from a thermal perspective, right? However, the CVT itself is also technology that may may be prone to more prone to failure than a simple uh, gear. So you need to be always very careful and and and, and wait all all, all <coughs> aspects. I think for, CVT was introduced in Formula One, um, and then next the next year, this usually happens. It was way fast. They were way faster. You can find if you if you Google uh, CVT Formula One. You don't hear the, the, the engine revs going up. From an entertainment perspective, I'm, I'm because the Formula One behind this is a game and it's a show. I don't know how, I mean, you like the, the, the sound of the gear changing and, and right? From a performance perfect perspective, it was very nice to the point that they forbid it the next year. So yeah, maybe, maybe in, in, in electric racing where noise is less uh, kind of entertaining. Nice. Other questions? Audience, I do not know, Trim, Marianne, if uh, we need to close or uh, how you are the bosses. Yeah, that, that's fine. If if there are one more question, that's that's fine. I, I while we're waiting, uh, thanks, Murdo. Uh, very fascinating talk. Um, I, I I especially noticed the thing. Well, one scary thing you said about you cannot always break as much as you want. That was a scary part of racing. I. Uh, <laughs> I noticed. I, I had a question, and I'm not sure if I'm able to phrase it correctly. But what if, like, like in the city, or like, like Tron, to the last part of your talk, like in the city, like, uh, like Trondheim, where it's 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 not it's not mainly about travel time. That's sort of not the main challenge we have, but we still want to, you know, constrain. Um, you still want to constrain people driving, basically, for other reasons, uh, climate, pollution, stuff like that. Is, that that's can, why. Can that's you why we still apply some of this this framework in your thinking. Yes, 
Um, yeah, in, in fact, if you look at this, uh, let's see, no, here. Here we, we, on purpose, I said social cost, C, and discomfort, D. And this can be anything. Basically, just the test to monotonically increase with, with the usage. But you could just say the, the number of cars. It could be linear in the number of cars. You want to minimize X, basically, right? Have as, as little cars as possible and so on and so forth. You can do it. Because in the end, you just need to state what you want. It doesn't matter where, where it comes out, right? It just has to be consistent. But uh, you can state what, what you would like to achieve. So I think it, it can really, there's a lot of in, um, interest in travel time because of obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, of course, from a societal perspective, these costs are not the same. In fact, in the paper, we also consider the case where C is something completely different and, and, and it works, right? So yeah. you also need to kind of align uh, different objectives societally and, and, and from the... And there's an, a question here that I think is extremely well connected to this. Because in a certain sense, whenever you introduce biking as an option, you might, uh, you might connect this to the design of operation of bike sharing systems. So that in a certain sense, this framework can also be used to help designing better bike sharing yeah. systems. Yeah. What are your insights yeah. on this? That's, that's, that's so true. And in fact, one of the questions we're, we're currently considering is, I mean, let's... Yeah, let's, let's take this line. Suppose that people here are also biking around. Um, also the type of framework. So we've seen two times we have uh, uh, free floating. Basically you park the bike wherever you want. And sometimes it's also quite detrimental because people throw them uh, randomly. But, but often I mean, you just, just park them where you stop using them, which is what we consider here. So we have this, this additional... Um, vehicle conservation constraints, you can not just make a bike appear or uh, docking stations. And that may be more useful for, um, for charging the bikes if they're electric and for more, uh, you know where they are, right? Okay. And then, yeah, usability, it's nice, I think. Then it's more a uh, societal, uh, social, or even psychological uh, problem, right? Would you rather uh, know that you don't know where you're going to pick up the bike, but you can leave it wherever you want, or you know where to pick it up, but then there are there are some specific docks where you have to leave it. Yeah. In Trondheim, we have a specific dock, so I think it works better than other places where I've experienced, yeah. but it's a personal opinion. Yeah, it depends. In San Francisco, we, we had both. And uh, yeah, I was, I was made more in favor of the free floating because sometimes uh, where, where I was, I didn't have a, a rack uh, close by. In Eindhoven, I have my bike. I mean, in the Netherlands, the first thing you have to do <laughs> when you want to integrate is buy a bike. Yes. And, and, and I mean, it, it's the best. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. I agree. I agree. So, uh... People, it's already 2.05. I do not know if uh, we unfortunately should, should close it uh, here. What do you think, Trim? Yeah, yes, I think it's uh, it, it's time to close it. Um, yes. So thanks a thanks, lot, uh, Mauro. thanks a lot, Maru. Thank you. It's been great. It was a Very great interesting. Pleasure. Thank you. And to the guys thanks. listening, people, everybody. Yeah, uh, you go. people. If you want to connect uh, with uh, with Mauro, just either send him an email or send me an email that I will forward and connect you with uh, with Mauro. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. Thanks for joining. Okay. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Bye. Have a fantastic day. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.